Hi everybody. On this show today, we are going to continue our discussion on getting your dog to work around distractions and by actually talking about getting some focus and getting some engagement around distractions. So last week, we talked about how to get your service dog to be calm around distractions as a part of our important um, three-part graphic here where we had, you know, focus, calmness and self-control. So last week I talked to you guys about um, how to build some calmness around distractions and how that was really important for building a dog who could work around distractions in general. So today I want to talk to the piece of our puzzle that is the focus on you bit. The part that says how do you actually get your dog to focus on you around distractions. So of course, the first thing we have to do is talk about what does focus look like? And so for us, when we are talking about working around distractions, I said we had calmness last week, which we define, you know, I told you how we define that, and how we define focus is actually more we think about engagement. So focus is actually defined as, and I've looked it up before, and of course I can't remember now exactly how focus is defined, but it's basically um, you know, your ability to sustain your attention on one thing for a sustained period of time. And so what we find a lot with dogs is that it isn't so much that they lack focus, although some of them do. So there, is, there are two types of general focus problems we see. One is with a dog who doesn't have any focus at all and he just flits from one thing to the next so there's a squirrel over here and a dog over there and a ball over there and he's just constantly going from one thing to the next we also have dogs that actually have really good focus it's just directed somewhere other than at you right so they might um, see other people and focus really well on other people but they're not focusing on you So we like to think about focus around distractions less as focus and more as engagement. So one of the big things that I see owner trainers do a lot is they haven't defined what they mean by focus. And when I start to talk to them about it, I'm finding that a lot of people actually want their dogs to like stare at them in public. And that isn't something that I necessarily recommend that you require. Now stick with me, I'm gonna get to that. I'm going to dig into this more in a second. For us, it is extremely, it's totally fine if our dogs want to watch other things and look around and notice the things that are in their environment. So if I'm walking through the mall, I don't need eye contact. I don't need my dog to walk looking like this. And I don't need him to, um, you know, when I stop to sit down, I don't need him to lay down and stare at me the whole time. What I need is for him to be calm while he's watching those distractions, which is what we talked about last week. And what I also need from him is engagement when I ask for it. Or if you have a task such as like diabetic alert, for example, um, you know, when, when there's an environmental cue to do a job. So what I mean by that then is that I want my dog to be calm enough around distractions that he's periodically checking in with me. I do like offered eye contact. So I want my dog to glance up at me, uh, depending on the situation, once or twice a minute, I guess. Now, if we're doing like a sustained down, if I've been sitting at a restaurant, you know, if I'm sitting at a booth or I'm sitting at a movie, I don't expect my dogs to offer eye contact really at all. But if we're, if we're moving around or I've just sat down, you know, I like the dogs to kind of check in with us periodically. Now I'm going to have to go the next time we're in public, I'm going to have to figure this out for you exactly how often I want my dog to offer me eye contact because I don't like having not having an answer for that so I'll get back to you guys on that one but I do like the dogs to periodically check in with us Um, but mostly what I want is the moment that I ask for their attention I want them to deliver it so they can look around at the environment all they want as long as once I ask them for something they start to then ignore the environment and engage with me So what that would mean is that, to me, the dog is responding to known cues with what we call low latency, which means if I ask my dog to sit, he sits instantly. He doesn't think about it for 30 seconds and then sit. So I talk about low latency is the the dog trainer term for it. So I was working on this at the mall with Drake the other day, 
and we were sitting at a bench and when I said his name, 90% of the time I would say Drake and he would instantly look at me. That's low latency. That's exactly what I want. Every now and then I would say his name and he would keep watching something, keep watching something, and then finally look at me. And that's not really what I want. I want low latency. I want him to look at me quickly. So I also want, once my dog has looked at me and started that engagement process, I want him to remain focused on me as long as I remain focused on him. So we actually teach this to our dogs. If I'm looking at you and we're engaging, you stay engaged with me until I stop engaging with you. So if I ask my dog for a couple of behaviors and then I turn to talk to somebody, our dogs have been taught that they can then lay down and start to scan their environment again. And we do give treats for that in the learning process, but there's a lot going on in this conversation. So when our dogs are engaged with us, that would mean to us, we want at that point, once we have asked for their attention, then I really do want eye contact. Now I want them to pay attention to me I want sustained eye contact unless I ask for something else. Um, I want them to respond to all known cues with low latency. And I want them to, for us, engagement, it's very important that our dogs are happy about it. So we want happy, open expressions. We want forward ears, raised heads. So when you're thinking about something like, what does focus mean to you? You need to sit down and make a list. Write down all of the things that that means to you so that a third party bystander who doesn't know anything about dog training could look at that list and go down the checkbox and decide whether or not your dog meets the criteria for engagement. Because if you don't know what your criteria is, how you describe focus, how you describe engagement, your dog is gonna have a hard time teasing it out as well. So it's important for you to know that. So when I picture a dog who's engaged, I think about any one of our service dogs who's actively working with us in a training session and there's lots of eye contact, their faces are happy and open, um, their ears are forward, their tail is pretty neutral, so it's definitely not low, but we don't want over arousal either, you know, neutral, happy tail. Um, and they clearly want to work with us. So I test engagement by perhaps clicking eye contact and throwing my treat out away from me in that direction. Does my dog eat it and immediately look back at me? I know I have engagement then because he ate his treat and then instead of going back to the environment, he came back to me. So that is one of our favorite exercises for building offered eye contact and engagement. And there are a lot of terms for this. So some trainers call it um, station stationing because the dog should be standing or sitting in front of you looking up at you. Um, some trainers are just gonna call it offered eye contact. Some are going to call it um, attention to handler. And then we use the, we just were, excuse me, we call it the orientation game because that was just a word, the word that stuck for me. So what we do a lot of is click when our dogs look at us and then drop a treat, hand them or drop a treat. So dropping the treat is kind of a test. It's okay, I have clicked, which to our dogs means you can now eat the thing off the floor. And that is a separate training exercise. So our dogs know they can only eat a treat off the floor when cued and the clicker is a cue that says you can have that off the floor. Um, so I just wanna make that distinction for service dogs. It's really important that your dog isn't just eating things. But if I click and drop my treat on the ground, my dog knows because he's been taught separately that that means he can go for that treat. Now, what does he do? Does he continue to sniff the ground and scan the environment or does he re-engage with me so I can click eye contact again? You can do this with a verbal marker, just like anything I tell you guys about. You can do this with a clicker or a verbal marker. Either one is fine. Um, although I have a preference for a clicker, but that's a separate discussion as well. Um, the other thing that we like to remind people when we're talking about engagement is that part of it is becoming interesting. So there is a very different, there's a big difference between me clicking and handing my dog a treat like this and me clicking and throwing him the treat, me clicking and getting excited about it, me clicking and running a couple steps and then handing the treat. All of that stuff is gonna build engagement. So with, depending on um, your dog, we actually really like to bring toys out when we're, we're training. So not, um, not like Walmart or anything like that, not the mall, um, but we will bring toys to the park or to parking lots or to anywhere that is generally considered dog friendly. Um, is a place that you can play with toys. 
So we will play with toys by um, asking our dogs to sit, letting them play tug, asking them to drop it, and then maybe sit again. We run a couple feet and play tug. Movement, movement is huge for building engagement. So if you, um, if you run a couple feet before you hand your dog a treat, sometimes that can really help to build engagement. But we really like play. Teaching your dog to play with you around distractions is an excellent way to help build that focus and build that engagement. Again, it's just not something you're going to do in the mall. You know, I, mean, I can't take a tennis ball to the mall and throw it down the aisle or anything like that. But I can do that, you know, at the park I'm sitting at right now. I can do that in a parking lot. I can do that um, anywhere that's dog friendly. You can do that. So the other things for building, let's see, oh yes, okay. So what I'm getting at is what we call your reinforcement strategy. So reinforcement is a thing that actually is more than just a thing. So if you're thinking about reinforcement as handing your dog a treat, then you're not utilizing it to its full potential. So when we talk about a reinforcement strategy, we talk about what you're using, so the value level of the treat, is it dog food, is it a hot dog, is it a toy? We're talking about when you plan on delivering the treat, where you plan on delivering the treat, how you plan on delivering the treat, or toy in any of those cases. So, as I said, if I click for eye contact and drop my treat on the ground, I'm resetting my dog to try again, I'm testing him to see if he's in more interested in the environment than he is in me. If I click and then run a few feet, I'm adding excitement, things like that. So we really are big on, before you go work around distractions, think about the reinforcement strategy that you're going to use and make sure that it's comparable to the level of distractions. So our dogs work for dog food at our facility, that's all they get. But when we go to the mall, most of them get something better than, than dog food because we're around a bunch of distractions and so we have to balance that somehow, right? So the other thing, which you're going to ha- I've said every week that we've been talking about building focus, is that if you want your dog to focus and engage with you around distractions, you have to set up scenarios in which you are controlling the distraction. So you have to set up scenarios in which you can control the intensity level and the distance from the distraction and start where your dog can be successful. So if you are, so if you are, um, out with your dog and your dog starts to bark, he starts to ignore known cues, he stops offering you eye contact, he starts pulling towards a distraction, you have already messed up your training session, which happens, we all do it. But if your dog is doing those things, you're already too close and you need to back up, you need to start farther away from your distraction and slowly move closer. Or, and or, you need to lower the intensity level of your distraction. So if we're talking about kids, you know, okay, let's actually hear. This is what we did. Um, we sent one of our service dog puppies to a new home the other day, and we, this is what we did. They have another dog. So they need the puppy to focus around their other dog. So first, when we brought the second dog into the room, she just sat still. We didn't have the dog moving. We had the dog on the other side of the room, so as much distance as possible, and stationary. And that lowers the intensity level of the distraction. As our puppy was doing well, then we started having that dog moving, okay? But the moment he started to fail, he started to lunge or pull or ignore his handler, we had the decoy dog stop moving to raise and lower the intensity level. You can do the same thing with distance. You maybe start 100 yards away and then you move closer. Um, So you need to be able to control the environment and you need to control your distractions and then move closer only as your dog is being successful. So something that a lot of agility handlers do, and I think that um, service dog training can learn a lot from a lot of these sports people. So the people who do, um, especially agility, because they're just masters at getting their dogs to focus around intense level of distractions. To focus, to work without food rewards or toy rewards and focus around crowds and dogs and barking dogs and people and noises and they're just they're masters at it and what you'll see a lot of agility people do if you go to a trial is they will have their puppies with them and they are just playing tug of war so they start in a quiet corner and they slowly move closer and so what you'll see with agility people is a four-month-old puppy playing tug of war with a hundred dogs in the room and 200 people in the room and all kinds of noises happening 
And so those dogs learn very early to ignore the environment and focus on their people and engage with their people through play. So I'm gonna look through, I know I have some questions popping up, so we're gonna kind of look through these. Um, okay. So a couple questions about the online course. So the online course is gonna be opening um, hopefully next week. So I will have videos for you guys or details for you guys coming out towards the end of this week. Um, I'm going to be out of town the end of the week to a place that doesn't have an internet signal. I'm going to the big air show in Oshkosh. Um, Oshkosh, Wisconsin is a huge air show. So many people come into the city of Oshkosh during this week that they bring in extra cell towers and the data still won't work. So I won't have an internet connection. So instead I'm going to be finalizing all the details that I promised you guys would be coming. Um, and so I will have details on the new online course coming out um, towards the end of the week. They are, it is now moving into our, what I will tell you is that we're reopening our training academy, which has all of our online courses inside of it. And it is going to be opening up as a monthly membership site. So instead of, um, you know, one six month course or one six week course, then you'll pay monthly. So it'd be like a monthly membership subscription basically. Um, but more details on that coming soon. So I know I have a couple other questions in here about focus. Okay. Okay. Yes. So two questions kind of along the similar lines. What do you do when you are in a parking lot, um, way in the back and a lot of people start to park next to you or children run at your dog? Do you end the training session? And then I also have, can you recover from a training mishap like being too close or do you need to just scrap it and wait till next time? So those both go kind of hand in hand. So one thing is that, you know, first of all, you want to set up as many, dis many um, situations that you can fully control. So if you can, um, you know, meet your friends at a park or something, because then you can ask them to stop moving and stuff. That's really ideal. When you are out in public, it is always okay to move your car, to go to a parking lot across the street. Um, and it is always okay to tell people they can't pet your dog, of course. Um, one of the things that we will do, so we have exits. Exit strategies are really important. When you are doing a training session and you can feel it's about to fall apart or you can see that, like you're describing, people have started to park next to you or people are coming at you. We have a couple of exit strategies. One looks like this. I'm gonna keep shoving food in my dog's mouth as I run away, walk away as fast as I can, okay? Cause I'm gonna just try and save it. I'm gonna try and keep my dog's attention on me while I leave the situation. And that might be putting my dog in the car. It might be getting away. Um, so if your dog, unless your dog is doing well, so if you've parked far away and the distractions come at you, it depends. Is your dog engaged with you still? Because then you can keep training. If he's not, then you have to stop training. And that's why you can, you need to decide what does engagement look like so that you know when your dog is no longer engaged with you. Um, so the answer is sometimes. Sometimes we keep training. Sometimes we put our dogs back in the car. Sometimes we move to a new location. It just kind of depends on the training session. And the same answer goes for can you recover from a training mishap like getting too close or do you have to scrap it and wait until next time? The answer is sometimes and it depends so how big of a mishap did I have um, did my dog bark and lunge and try to drag me towards people because that's different than um, my dog just started to ignore me but the biggest thing that decides whether or not we quit or and just call it a day or we continue to try is if I get too close or I get flooded by distractions if I create distance and I move my dog further away, what happens? Does he re-engage with me or does he stay distracted? Because if, if I get, if my distraction's off that way and I get too close and my dog, let's say he barks. If I move a hundred yards that direction or however many yards you would need or however many yards you have at your disposal, does your dog re-engage with you once you've moved a hundred yards that direction? Because if he does, then you can move close, then you can still train and you can move closer again. If he won't engage with you, then you have to, then you have to leave. 
then you have to go, okay, I, I can't get his attention back. And so it's time to just call it and try again later. Um, because I'm always okay with, with saving a training session if it's possible. If your dog will re-engage with you, if he gets back to work, how badly he fails, you know, so it really just, it, it depends. And okay, so for example, um, I was take we took Amelia into public on Friday and she must be going through a fear period. Um, and she saw somebody in the parking lot and she barked. So we immediately moved backwards. She got a whole bunch of treats, Jess got her re-engaged, and we slowly started to move forward again. And she was able to then make it all the way to the front of the store. We didn't go in. Okay, so that's the other thing is we'd already had one failure outside. We weren't going to test it by going in. But because when we backed away, she re-engaged and she, was, it, she wanted to train again, we were able to move closer. Had she not been able to re-engage once we moved away, we would have tried moving further away. And if that didn't work, we would have just said, okay, we're going to try again tomorrow. So I hope that that kind of answers your question. Inside the academy, there's going to be a whole section of training journals where you can actually weekly, we'll be giving out um, unedited training videos of us training our dogs. So you can start to see some of that stuff. So you can see where we make decisions and I actually put it into the notes so you can see why we made decisions that we made. Um, Cause some of this is hard to explain when I don't have a dog to demonstrate. But I'm also in the process of getting a new software that would allow me to show videos when I do these lives. So that would be really cool. Um, okay. And the other piece I'll say um, about if you start to get flooded with distractions, increase your rate of reinforcement. So actually, and Chris, Christina, I see you're on here now. <laughs> this just made me think of this. Um, so when she was here picking up her puppy, her husband's a photographer, so I, or a videographer, both. And um, he was explaining to me how to better use my camera. And so he came, he was telling me, he gave me an analogy that I am now going to use for you guys, but this is not mine. He came up with this and in his world, it applies to using a camera in my world, it applies to dog training. So if you have a teeter-totter, right, you, and the point is in the middle, right? So we have a teeter-totter that goes like this. You kind of need two equally weighted kids to make the teeter-totter go up and down, right? If you have a really fat kid on this side and a really little kid on this side, you're going to have trouble because your teeter-totter is always going to go like this, and it's not going to stay nice and balanced, right? So with dog training, it's the same. If I have heavy distractions and my teeter-totter starts to fall down, I have to do something on this side of the teeter-totter to balance it out. That could be distance. You could move further away. It can be your rate of reinforcement. So you start giving your dog a lot more treats for paying attention to you. Um, it could be that you get out a better treat. Maybe you have two types of treats with you. And as the distractions close in, then you, um, you use hot dogs instead of the dog food you had on you but you have to balance it somehow. So you want to think about your teeter-totter. If, if, if one side starts to get really weighted down, it's time to put some weight back on the other side, right? All right, and like I said, there will be hopefully in the future videos of this kind of stuff coming for you guys to see both during these lives and then if anybody does join us in the membership site. So if you are, have any more questions, throw them in the comments. Even if you're watching the replay, we will answer them for you. Um, make sure to like and share this video if you found it helpful. You can share this anywhere that other owner trainers might, um, might find the video useful. Otherwise, I will see you guys next week. And we are going to talk more about, let me find my outline here. Oh yeah, the third piece of our little um, focus graphic, which is self-control. So we're going to talk about self-control around distractions and why that is equally as important as focus and engagement is. So I will see you guys next week and let us know if you have any questions.